All right. Well, one of the reasons that we can be confident in the truth of the Bible is that it does not hide the mistakes of God's followers. Isn't that cool? Isn't that cool that we're reading a, a, the Word of God and the Word of God does not hide the failings of the disciples? You know, when, yes, of course, you have Job, and it looks like Job is, you know, this fine, upstanding person. Yes, you have Esther, and you read about, you know, how Esther, you know, all of her, the, the, the good events that occurred in her life. But then you have Abraham, and you read about his great faith, but you also read about the times he failed. And you talk about David. David was a man after God's own heart. Wow. But you also read about the times that he failed. So it's really awesome that we have a text where we can see the people who were committed to God and also see the times that they failed. To me, that's inspiring. One, it helps me have confidence in this book. No one was trying to hide anything. The Holy Spirit was not hiding anything. You know, oftentimes if I'm going to write a, bi a biography about my life, an autobiography, there are some things about my life that I want to hide from, from all the eyes that might read that biography. That's not so with the, the Bible. And one of the things that we're going to read today is, I won't call it a failing, but it certainly exposes a time of struggle in the faith life of the disciples. And I just, I love the fact that we can see that because it helps me in my humanness fit in <laughs> and say, ha, ah, you know, if, if they can still be one of God's people, I and my own failings can still be one of God's people. And so we're going to pick up in, in chapter 8, Matthew chapter 8, verse 23. Verse 23 starts a little episode. Remember, we're, we're working through at this point um, some of the miracles that, got, that Jesus performed as evidences. Matthew's putting them in, in the text as evidences that he is the Messiah. So he's stacking these miracles together because his audience are the Jews. And he's saying, look, here's what Jesus said. And what Jesus said gives evidence alone to his messiahship but now here's what jesus did and what jesus is doing gives evidence to his messiahship so we're going through small episodes where matthew's put them together and, and we are talking today about jesus calming the storm now he did that on multiple occasions but this is one of them it says in verse 23 he got into the boat and his disciples followed him Suddenly, a furious storm came up on the lake so that the waves swept over the boat. But Jesus was sleeping. Jesus, uh, the disciples, I'm sorry, verse 25, the disciples went and woke him saying, Lord, save us, we're going to drown. And he replied, you of little faith, why are you so afraid? But he got up and rebuked the winds and the waves and it was completely calm. The men were amazed and asked, what kind of man is this? Even the winds and the waves obey him. So we talked a little bit last week about Jesus wanting to go to the other side. You know, it says Jesus got into the boat and the disciples followed him. What he was doing was going to the other side of the lake. Jesus would go to the other side of the lake. Let me put that back. Oh, I can still see the outline. Jesus would go to the other side of the lake. Often you read about going to the other side when he needed solitude. We're going to read about him going to the other side after he hears about the death of John, the Baptist. And he kind of wants to be alone. Unfortunately, he doesn't, that doesn't come true. But he goes to the other side. So we talked about going to the other side. Remember, Capernaum, his home base, is right here. About right there. When you go to the other side, which way are you going? You're going east. This is generally called the other side, or, or interpreted as the other side. We talked about this last week. Who lives on the other side? Primarily Gentiles. This is a Gentile area. This is Galilee. The area that we know of as Galilee is kind of over here on the west side of the lake. Nazareth, remember? Well, Nazareth is, is 
Yeah, I'm going to judge right there. Good enough. Okay. And then Jesus moves from Nazareth up to Capernaum as his home base. And he goes throughout all the towns of Galilee or many of them. Okay. Throughout all of Galilee, teaching and preaching and healing. But now he goes to the other side. And on the other side is a Gentile world. It's a world that a lot of Jews aren't going to go to. And so there's less likelihood that there would be this huge population coming out to see him. And so he has an opportunity for more solitude. Another reason he has more opportunity for solitude is this is a very mountainous area, um, cliffs, and uh, kind of hard to navigate. So he's going to go over here and hopefully get some rest. And that's me speaking. That's not what it says in, in the text. But I think that's, in this case, why he's going to the other side. Um, now, as you're traveling on the Sea of Galilee, the Sea of Galilee is about, at its biggest width, about seven to eight miles, seven to eight miles wide and about 13 miles tall-ish. And so as you're traveling across the sea, there are two different kinds of winds that might come up. And, and one of the kinds of winds come from the Mediterranean Sea. The Mediterranean Sea is over here. And so you have winds coming off the sea. They're going to go up and over. There's, there's, remember, Nazareth is kind of in the hillside. There's some hills over here. Um, and so it's going to come up and over. And the Sea of Galilee is lower than sea level. It's in a bowl. Pretty much there's a bowl with mountains all around. And so wind will come sweeping down and through the, through the canyons over here on the west side and cause a lot of disturbance in the water as it travels this way. Okay, that's one kind of storm. And we read about that storm in the next series where Jesus uh, calms the storm. He's walking on the water and the, the Disciples are rowing and rowing and rowing. Well, they're rowing against the wind because they were going from this side to this side and the wind was hitting them from the front. Okay. Another kind of wind, Mount Hermon is up here and wind comes sweeping down this way and kind of goes this direction. So this is another kind of wind. Either wind can be sudden and either wind can be treacherous. In fact, this one has been known. There's a city called Tiberias right over here. It's been known to create 30-foot waves in Tiberias. So that, I mean, you're talking a seven-mile a seven stretch where it can build up, and there's some big crashing waves that could happen. That's the kind of wind that we see here because they're coming this direction, and so they're getting a crosswind. And the crosswind is blowing those waves up and over the bow of the boat, up and over the side. And so they're seeing this water, and they're probably three of them are back there, you know, shoveling it out. And Jesus is up there sleeping. And Lord, don't you care? We're about to die. Save us. So that's the kind of storm we may be dealing with here. And they are sudden. Some of them are sudden storms. So fishermen on the, sea, on the Sea of Galilee know it could be calm in the morning and you're out in the middle of there fishing and all of a sudden something whips up and you just drop everything and try to go to shore. And depending on which direction the wind's coming from, tells you which shoreline you need to head to. Okay. <clears throat> Let's talk about something else. The boat. Who... Does anyone know approximately what kind of boat we're looking at here? A rowboat? There were, there were places where, if four, most probably, where four men could row. Two on each side. Okay. In about 19, I want to say 86, two fishermen and amateur archaeologists from Galilee, from the Galilee area, discovered a boat in the sand of the shoreline, or actually probably in the water, underneath the, the water um, of the sea. For the last century, 
the sea level, the Sea of Galilee has been, the level has been going down. Part of that's because of irrigation and control. Part of it's just uh, natural uh, evaporation and that sort of thing. <clears throat> but it's been going down. So as the level went down and we have more technology and more people interested, this boat was discovered. This boat has been dated, using carbon dating, to somewhere between 50 B.C. and about 50 AD 50. So the boat itself was one that might have existed at the time that Jesus was on the, the Sea of Galilee. People have named it, they've dubbed it the Jesus boat. Um, <clears throat> you know, certainly he could have been in this boat. It's not likely, but certainly he, it's a boat like the one that he might have been in in this occasion. So they have, um, what they did is they put some sort of styrofoam around it to kind of keep it in place and they floated it up and they floated it down and then they bathed it in oil for 11 years to, to kind of get all of the impurities out and so that it, it now is, is on a display at a museum for you to see. And yes, there is, I mean, it's, it's just kind of the skeleton of this boat. It's not a fully nicely built boat. <clears throat> but from it, we can get an idea of what the boats looked like back then. This boat was about 27 feet long. We're probably looking at, well, these are eight foot tables. So maybe, maybe about this foot to the end, from here to the end of the, uh, the table over there. About that long and about seven and a half feet wide. I've got a pontoon that's 26 feet long and eight feet wide. And so I'm thinking about that going, okay, this is, this is the size, practically the size of this boat that you had all of the disciples in and Jesus, and Jesus is able to sleep in the bow. Generally speaking, it held 15 people, probably max. Four people could row at a time. It probably had a mast. Some of them did, some of them didn't, but uh, you could put up the mast and open the sail to catch the wind. Or if you had these side winds, you wanted to take that mast down because it would catch the wind and blow you over. That wouldn't be a good thing. Um, it, this particular boat was, it looks like it has been over time repaired by various pieces of wood or kinds of wood. Uh, so it, it probably has seen a long life in service. Um, we know that the, you know, even the, the disciples were mending their nets. Well, likely they also had to mend their boats at times. Mm. Four people masked sailing. Yeah. Questions about the boat? Oh, it's actually called. They've, people call it the Jesus boat, but they've actually called it the ancient Galilee boat. Yeah. It's a pretty good name. <laughs> ancient Galilee boat. So that's approximately the size. So when we read this story and it says that they were all, uh, you know, seeing the waves. Oh, it was only about four feet deep. So it's a pretty shallow boat. And a lot of these boats were flat on the bottom so that they could actually get up to the shoreline pretty close. Um, and the Sea of Galilee is deep or not? The Sea of Galilee, for an it's deep. Um, as much as 200 feet. But for people of the world out there, 200 feet is nothing. So it's not really that deep in context with other lakes and, and, and the ocean itself. It's only at its deepest, it's about 200 feet. Um, oh, go ahead. Four feet sounds deep enough for a fisherman to stand at his side, pull on his nets and still be safe. From the yes, in. yes. Uh, in fact, they may have had, you know how boats have a, a little bit of a, a swoop, sweep up from the floor to the bow, there may have been multiple steps or something where they could kind of found themselves lower and then have some pivot point here so that they could pull up their nets. Most of the fishing happened with nets that they either threw overboard or they drug behind the boat. And then they would pull, pull that net back up with the fish in it. And we can read stories about that happening too in the Bible. Uh, awesome. The uh, deepest points tend to be where the Jordan River comes in and it flows through and then it flows out, that river basin is going to be your deepest points. And the, 
hills or the cliff sides over here are steep. They're steeper than they are. This is a gentle slope down to the shoreline. In fact, right here, it's about, I want to say, a mile in that's kind of called the plain. And so it, it's, it's a gentler slope. Um, in fact, what we had said was the, the, where the likely place that the Sermon on the Mount took place is a gentle hillside that has this kind of um, arc or, or a, what's my word, concave shape to it. Whereas over here, it's, it's a lot steeper. And so it'll go more steeply down into that river basin that's down below the water. Um, yes? Have you? How did it feel? Just like you're in a boat. Probably 15 people on it. Okay. What, um, what were the waves like at that time? You know, you were probably there and it wasn't storming. It wasn't storming. It was just like a regular lake. Regular lake. Okay. Now, most of our lakes aren't, there's not a place that's seven to eight miles wide by 13 miles. We can't get a, a picture of what that looks like. I mean, I fish in Fort Gibson a lot, and it's about a mile and a half from one side to the other, maybe two, depending on where you are. Uh, Eufaula is, is pretty big in certain places, but I'm not sure it's just one big open area. So it's, it's hard for us to mentally get a, an idea. You were going to say something? Oh, yeah, if you, if you Google uh, ancient Galilean boat, uh, probably the images, there's going to be some images of, of it. It doesn't, does it? No, but I have a question that's not real religious, but where did they get that boat? I mean, who was <laughs> Well, no one knows whose boat it was, but it was found, I want to say, on the eastern side over here, just off the shoreline underneath the water. Uh, and, and it was found in 1986, I think it says by a couple of fishermen, people, people who actually are employed today as fishermen on the, the lake. And they are also amateur archaeologists. And so they had been for years kind of scouring the, land, the, the landscape and the seaside because they kept wanting to find something that gave insight to the culture and the, and the times uh, of, of that area in the past. And I guess at some point in time they kicked their toe on this thing and, you know, went underwater and said, wow, look, a boat. And they told the authorities about it and word got out. And a lot of people made some rumor assumption that there was uh, gold or some sort of, you know, uh, treasure in this boat. So they actually had to place guards around the boat to keep people from coming in before they could get it up and out of there. Uh, yeah, interesting little story. Oh, where did the disciples get the boat? Um, well, if you remember, uh, almost half of the disciples were fishermen already. And so they're... Um, Zebedee... They, they still, Peter, Peter, who was a fisherman, lived in Capernaum. Um, and, and so likely their base, their fisher base was right in here. And so they still had access to their family boats. Um, so very likely they, it, it could have been a, a family member who they just borrowed a family boat. Uh, my theory is the disciples were not a one boat Fisher family, barely eking by as they went along. My theory is this was a fishing business, and they employed a number of fishermen and a number of boats, and so there was a fleet of these boats, and they weren't alone in this. I mean, this is, a, this is an industry. There, were, there are lots of fish in this lake. So this is an industry that is, is very common on this lake. So there are going to be a lot of boats floating around here, uh, that could be borrowed or, or, or used. And when you have people who are follow, faithful in following Jesus, they still had ownership of certain things. And 
they would have had a boat that was useful. And when it says, and I know you referred to, they dropped everything and followed. I think we, in our minds, hear that, read that, and we hear that they just left everything behind and cut ties, cut all ties. But we know they didn't cut all ties because Peter was still living in his house with his, his wife and, so there, and his mother-in-law, and there were, there were still ties that were there. I don't think they cut all ties, but what they did was they left the business. They still had relationships with the family. They still had, they might have even um, kept up with their fishing buddies. And, you know, on their days off, they probably went fishing. We, don't, we aren't told about every day in the three years of Jesus' ministry, so it may be that they took a day off and they went fishing. We, we don't really know, but we know they had access to boats. Whose boat it was, we honestly don't know. Um, and, and I hate for anyone to think, we're going to talk about, well, time always gets away from us. But in the calling of Matthew, if, if you jump over to chapter 9, verse 9, it says, uh, Matthew was sitting at the tax collector's booth and Jesus said, follow me. And Matthew got up and followed him. Now, did Matthew, sitting in the tax collector's booth, go, cool, and just walk off? Not likely. Very irresponsible. It's not likely that that's how it happened, but that's how we read that it happened. Remember, it's written for a purpose in a way. And so, basically, it's saying there was already some preparation going on. And when Jesus said, it's time, Matthew had already made those preparations. Probably he was not the only one in the booth at that time. He could hand off the business if necessary. And uh, it may not even be that he walked out with Jesus when Jesus said, it's time. It's time. Awesome. Close of day. He, he walks out of the booth and he's now retired. So we don't really know necessarily how that action happened. We read it a certain way, but I don't think it happened that way. Uh, it wasn't like, drop the mic and we're just going to walk off. Yes, um, and, and all of the synoptic gospels talk about that dinner. There is disagreement as to the distance of time between the time Matthew was called. We'll talk about this later, but the distance of time between the time Matthew was called and the dinner at the house. Some people think there was actually a lot of time between those two. Um, whether there was or not, it's convenient to put them together because it leads into what Jesus is trying to say. And, and we'll talk about that when we get there. But I think it's together for a reason, whether or not there's time to pass or not. Okay. The boat. I think we're good on the boat. The storm. We've talked about the storm and the various kinds of storms. Now remember, these were experienced fishermen. Some of them were. They would have known how to approach this storm. They would have known possibly even to expect the storm. And yet, here they are in this situation where there's a storm on them. They feel anxious enough to needfully cry out to Jesus. Who's asleep in the boat? Do you really think? I just wonder, was he really asleep? I just can picture him going, <laughs> I'm just waiting. I'm just waiting. Just... <laughs> And then finally, when they cry out for help, oh, you want my help? Oh, I don't know whether he was asleep or not. You know, it's only a 27-foot boat. <laughs> and it's only a, we'll call it eight-mile journey. So, what, I mean, he was probably tired. I mean, he, he was a busy man. And he could have easily needed a nap. Um, <laughs> yeah, that's right. He, he was done with it. Moved up to the bow. Here's the thing. When they call on Jesus, and he says, You of little faith, why are you so afraid? Let's compare that, and we did this before, the other direction. But in my Bible, if you look at the other column, if you go over to 
verse... It's still in chapter 8. It's verse... Oh, servant lies. What do we do? Eight. No, ten. Verse ten. Remember, the centurion asked Jesus to come or to heal, not to come, but to heal his servant. And the centurion talks about this authority that Jesus has. And he talks about how I think. He's implying that Jesus is directly connected to the prime authority of the, of the universe, God. And how Jesus carries that same authority. And Jesus says in verse 10, when he heard this, he was amazed and said to those, Truly I tell you, I have not found anyone in Israel with such great faith. Now flip over to our story, verse 26. You of little faith... Why are you so afraid? Who did they think was in the boat? Do you think they got, they really got it, that this was God in the boat? We, we, we can't, I mean, we can presume. We, we can't know for, you know, assurance. But you see, there's a little bit of a difference between the absolute confidence of the centurion and the little bit of maybe doubt that the disciples had. I mean, these disciples had seen all the other things he had done. And yet, when it comes to the winds and the waves, and he gets up and he says, be still. They go, whoa. Did you just see that? That was so cool. Who is he? I don't know, but I like him. A little bit of doubt, seeds of doubt, compared to the confidence that the centurion had. I don't know, just something to play with. It, it's, it's not ours to say whether they had immense great faith or not, but it just seems like they hadn't quite pegged who this Jesus person was yet. They were still trying to figure that out. And I think that's why Jesus said, I have not found such a faith even in Israel. The men were amazed and asked, what kind of man is this? Even the winds and the waves obey him. Now, if they had known their Bible, do I have it? Yes, Psalm 107. Let me read Psalm 107. There are other passages in Psalms. In fact, Psalm 65, 7 talks about it. Psalm 89 talks about it. But there's a fairly lengthy section in Psalms 107. And I want to read that. It's, it's about eight verses, no, six verses. Starting in verse 23. If they had known their Bible, they wouldn't ask, who is this? What kind of man is this? Verse 23 of Psalm 107. Let me get to it here. Some went out. This is, this is a, a, a praise for the Lord because he's so good. Some went out on, sea, on the sea in ships. They were mer merchants on the mighty waters. They saw the works of the Lord, His wonderful deeds in the deep. For He spoke and stirred up a tempest that lifted high the waves. Oh, wait a minute. Do you think Jesus might have caused that storm? Don't know, but wow. Could have. Says that, that the Lord stirred up the tempest. They mounted up to the heavens, the waves did, mounted up to the heavens and went down to the depths. In, the peril, in their peril, the courage melted away. So these fishermen, these fishermen who had been, they were merchants, they were in ships, it was just their life. Their courage melted away because of the, the sea and the weather. They reeled and staggered like drunkards. They were at their wit's end. Then they cried out to the Lord in their trouble and he brought them out of their distress. He stilled the storm to a whisper, and the waves of the sea were hushed. They were glad when it grew calm, and he guided them to their desired haven. So, you know, this is Psalms. This was in their scriptures. This predated the event. 
Now, whether or not it's talking about that specific event, that's, that's not, not necessarily the point. But the psalm is saying, God does this. This is God at work. The men were amazed and said, what kind of man is this that even the winds and the waves obey? God. What kind of man? Jesus? God. Why is that here? Because Matthew is drawing a point. Matthew is trying to get the, the Jews who are reading this to a, a point where they say, Ooh, I can connect the dots. Absolutely, this man Jesus is the Messiah. Every one of these little vignettes are trying to make that point. That's why that's here. And what's funny, we don't have time to do it today, so we're going to get out just a smidgen early. Ooh, you like that? Plus, plus, I only went through this much of my notes. I like that part too. What's funny is the next episode answers their question. They say, what kind of man is this? They encounter two demons, and the two demons say, what? Yes. They say, son of God. What have you come to do with us? They answer their question. Like, Who is he? What kind of man is this? Demons say, this is the son of God. What a irony. <laughs> really, what an irony. So we'll get to that next week. We'll talk about these demon-possessed or demon-possessed men. Now, if we were to look at the other narratives, the other synoptic gospels, some of those talk about a man. We'll talk about it next week, but why does why do we have two men? Why do we have one man? A lot of people think there's a lead guy that does the speaking. This the demon the demons were many. Uh, and they could have embodied more than one person. Um, the number is not the point. The, the activity and the conversation they have with Jesus is the point. So we'll talk about it next week. And uh, wow, I really, honestly, I truly thought we'd get farther than this. But that's okay. That's okay. Uh, as I mentioned, we are very slowly working our way through Matthew. Yes, ma'am. Absolutely. You know, and this is why when I said at the beginning, I'm so glad that we see uh, not necessarily the failings of the disciples, but we see the weak faith that they might have. Because we in our own world, in our own walk, often carry that same weak faith. You know, faith and fear. You know, I, this is more than I can handle. I don't, I can't, you know, how am I going to master the winds and the waves of life and, and navigate what the life throws at me. Well, wake the man up in the bow. <laughs> Have faith in the one who's walking with you, who's, who's riding in the boat with you. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean that every situation, the storm is going to cease. But confidence and faith in Jesus will still give you joy and will still give you peace in the midst of a storm. And that's important. Um, and, and once again, this gets, I, I love that we did that whole series on the upper story and the, and the lower story because the storm of life happens in the lower story. The peace and the joy of life happens in that upper story. And yes, God is concerned about our surrounding and our life and our existence on this earth, but He is most concerned about our spiritual walk and our life in that upper story. And, and just tie into that. And that's kind of, I think, what the disciples were called to do here. And, and that's, you know, I can imagine Jesus looking around and saying, you bozos, where's your faith? You know, where's your faith? Did you, have you seen all the things I've been doing? You know, it's not like that stayed Jesus. Oh, ye of little faith. I can see him going, are you nuts? Who do you think I am? Whew. You know, yeah. Just the juxtaposition of Abraham. 
Mm. I'm gonna do things my way. This is a grand plan. Right. Hagar and Ishmael, and that was not God's not God's plan. plan. That's right. And then you have Sarah and Isaac, and God sitting here thinking, "Ooh, wasn't that such a brilliant idea?" <laughs> that we are still having to deal with. Yeah, there's fallout from man's attempts to do God, to, to play God. And I think yeah. Job, who was trying his best to do what was right, still questioned God. He did. And God, his final word was, were you there when I created all this? It. Right. I'm sovereign. All the all my plans have they've already been tested. They've yeah. already been set in place. And you think you're smarter than I am? Right. Well and, and you know, I love the I love Job. Um, because Job makes me feel safe to question God. Yes. You know, he had great faith in God. He knew that he had a proper walk with God, and yet he could say, God, why? What on earth is going on? Yeah. I don't get it. And here his wife and his saying, yeah, you did something wrong. <laughs> yeah, which is, this is going to be an interesting point, because we're going to get to a point uh, in chapter 9, verse, verse, first segue, first vignette in chapter 9, that seems to link sin with illness. And so, when we look at Job, we know that it wasn't sin that brought his circumstance. So, we, we're going to look at how that works and how, in, in chapter 9, we see this apparent link. And there are other verses that draw an apparent link. But there are other verses where we also see that that link doesn't, isn't always true, if ever if it's ever true, that link is not always true. So we'll have that conversation, and we can bring Job back into that at that time if we want. Uh, it's an interesting talk. It's an interesting conversation. I don't know that we will confidently iron it out, but it will definitely kind of generate some ideas and thoughts. So it'll be, it'll be good. We might get to that next week. I thought we might get there this week, but at this pace, who knows? It might be December. <laughs> Let's pray, and then we'll be dismissed. Father, thank you, thank you, thank you for your word. Uh, it is so fun to read your word. Uh, it's, it's engaging, it helps us understand your will, and it helps us understand our walk within your will. But at the same time, it helps us see other people's walk and, and how they might have had seeds of doubt, and yet at the same time, walked side by side with your son, our Savior, and how even in our lives we may have those same seeds of doubt. But we, Lord, know that we can have confidence. We know that even with those concerns and, and fears that we carry with us, we have confidence that your Son can calm the waves, can calm the storm. And that he has already brought us through that storm in, into your palace, into your throne room. And we can call you Father because of His work. Thank you, Father, for this class, and thank you for this day, and thank you for our nation that gives us the liberty to talk through your word and to think through your word. And Father, help us to apply the things that we learn uh, to our lives, that we may be shining lights to the people around us, that they may not glorify us, but glorify you because of us. Thank you, Father, for the many blessings Help us to use them in ways that uh, benefit your kingdom and glorify you. We pray these things through your Son. Amen.